Hey, Frank. Hello. Thanks for taking the time. My pleasure. And Ben, thanks for sitting in with Frank. I'm going to focus mostly on I'm here to Mr. Supervise. Turner, if that's all right. Uh, how do you write a song? And I know every song is not the same, and that's a loaded question, but in general, how does Frank Turner? Um, well, it's, I mean, it's, yeah, it's very varied. It's a very lengthy process. I mean, generally speaking, there's the kind of, there, the stages are, there's the kind of, for want of a less hackneyed term, there's the inspiration moment when you just kind of get an idea, you know, and it just kind of hits you in the shower or walking down the street, whatever it might be. Or you just start humming a melody or you toy with a sentence that feels good or you read something that's inspiring. Um, and then there's the kind of, there's the um, hammering it out part where you have to kind of like, take a few of those little bits of inspiration and try and um, create a first draft, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that's, the, that's sort of the hard work part, I think. Well, maybe not the hardest part, because then there's the editing process. I go through a lot of edits where, you know, just sort of trying different um, ways of looking at it, different arrangements, um, you know, even just, you know, is it going to be a rock song or is it going to be a folk song or whatever, you know, and just sort of taking it through that process and then um, generally speaking I then take it to the Sleeping Souls and we kind of uh, hammer some stuff out there as well my band and then it gets recorded and it gets released and then I keep fucking with it live so yeah, yeah. I mean in a way I think that songs have a they keep uh, they keep growing you know what I mean after you after finishing one, one of the weird things for me is occasionally I sort of forget that when people you know people come to a show or whatever who are really into a song the version they have in their heads is the one that I recorded you know, if it's, let's say, the song Photosynthesis, you know, we recorded that song in 2007, yeah. and there's people who are humming that version of it, and man, we don't play it like that anymore, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's kind of a little surprising to me sometimes to kind of go, oh shit, that's, huh, that's how you Do they want it, yeah, because they have that in their head. Yeah, I mean, it's... And they're probably semi-disappointed. Uh, well, I don't yeah, know about like... this point. I mean, <laughs> hopefully they're, they're entertained by the way that the new lease of life the song has. But yeah, it's, and, you know, I generally keep the sort of song structure and lyrics the same I mean particularly the lyrics which is the thing I spend the most time on but um, it's fun I think songs should change and grow almost like a child then yeah I mean they're, they're, they're organic creations yeah and do you have a favorite song well uh, l let me put it this way are your favorite songs the ones that like almost come to you full formed or the ones that like you said you have to hammer them out like, I, I'm sure you've had a song that just came to you easy, yeah. and, and that's just the way yeah, it I is. Yeah, I mean, I wrote the song for Australia in about 20 minutes, um, fully formed top to bottom, which was, including the arrangement, actually, which was, uh, that was a, a moment of feeling like a real songwriter, you know <laughs> what I mean? Um, and then there are other songs that have taken a lifetime. I mean, um, where I tend to be, there's about 9 million different drafts of that. Um, I'm actually currently in the middle of about my 400th draft of another particular song that I'm having yet another go at finishing for my next record. It's just got it's just got a couple of really really strong ideas in, and I can't find a way of putting them together that does them justice. And I've been trying for a really long time now. Um, I'll do it. Okay. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, I'm not sure that my preference in songs is related to that in a linear fashion. You know what I mean? Um, I guess my preference in songs are just for songs that. Uh, I like songs that tell me something when I listen back to them, you know, um, and I don't listen to my own material very often, I mean, I'm usually playing it, um, but just to kind of, um, there are songs where I just kind of, if I haven't played them for a while or if I just think about them again, you kind of go, oh yeah, okay, it's kind of interesting, that says something, you know. Either about the time period or about yourself. Yeah, or just, or... Well, just basically where I almost become an audience member, do you know what I mean, yeah. of my own material, which doesn't happen with all the songs I write at all, but like, um, my favorite ones that that's the kind of feeling that I have that's brilliant uh, do you how do you balance between art and commerce because there's the art aspect but then there's the comma co commerce part so sure. how, how do you watch the movie did you, <laughs> oh do you cover that all right good I like well. the tease well played I mean I think that um, I mean on the you know I try and keep sort of writing and creation sex sex as an artistic activity and I try and I play the game you know I want to be successful in what I do but sort of promoting a song is different from writing it you know what I mean um, so I'll do radio interviews and I'll make music videos and I'll uh, play TV shows and stuff like that that's the commerce side but that's all 
dealing with material that was written in a more integral way. The other thing I would say, though, is that I think that there's a dichotomy that people pose to in art and commerce, which is not entirely um, real. I think that, just in the sense that there's a somewhere philosophically buried in the idea that art and commerce are separate ideas, is the idea that like good things aren't popular. Sure. And I think that that's not actually necessarily true at all. I think that some of the best music is popular because, because that's the other thing. If you if you make the statement, good, well, you know, great art isn't popular, there's a gigantic amount of arrogance in that statement because the implication is that like, well, you know, I get it. I mean, the people that get it, <laughs> I get it. Do you know what I mean? Um, and, and, and I well, think... It's hipsterism. That's, that's, yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, hipster yeah and, it's, and, and I, again, I think that's bullshit. And some of my all-time favorite songs are some of the most popular, successful songs ever. I mean, the, the example I always reach for is ABBA, who, if you, if you don't think ABBA is one of the greatest bands of the 20th century, you don't know anything about songwriting. They are flawlessly phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and they were wildly successful, and deservedly so. And good for them so it makes sense yeah totally I mean yeah. that's not always true all true, the time yeah, sure. there's, there's <laughs> lovely like this for like, instance yeah. yeah but you know there's a, there's a <laughs> bunch of um, obviously there's a lot of music that I adore that hasn't been popular that's been obscurantist and all the rest of it that I think is artistically valid but yeah I don't know I just sort of think that like sometimes that idea that um, for it to be artistically valid it has to be non-commercial I think is, is a flawed idea I, Bob Dylan has sold quite a lot of records <laughs> Just a few. Uh, when did you know music was not going to be a hobby? Ooh, uh, well, I mean, there's part of me that's still slightly keeping an eye on that. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's a very fickle industry. Um, and I'm fortunate that for the last uh, sort of 10, 15 years, I've been able to make my hobby my living. And that's a wonderful privilege to have in life. But... Um, there's no guarantee that that will always remain the case. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, it's always, it's, since I was 10, it's been my obsession, but that's a slightly different thing. Um, but, I think you're pretty safe. Yeah, well, so, I mean, I have this whole theory, that I have this graph that I draw about um, where careers sort of settle down over time, and, and the big question everybody's asking, you know, but your average career kind of goes up, it peaks, then it comes down a little bit, and then it settles somewhere, and the question is, is the settle line above the don't have just, to get another job line? <laughs> You know what I mean? And um, hopefully I'm in that place in my life now. But you never know. MC Hammer works as a painter and decorator these days. So, And he used to... What were we reading the other day? He used to spend half a million dollars a, a month, was it? Stop it. He had, he had a staff of 300, 200? Yeah, yeah. Two, it was 200 people. He had a for domestic staff of 200 people. I literally cannot think of 200 roles. <laughs> he had two private that you could fill. Yeah. in case one of them was dirty. But well, I mean, like, if you, you got cleaners, cooks... Actually, that's pretty you know, smart, really. Right. I mean, when but you I mean, come down to you it. Know, if you got cleaning, you got a cook, you got a chauffeur, you got a... I mean, you, <laughs> can, you need maximum with this shit, and you're going to get to about 50. Maybe for you. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you can have seven tennis courts. But okay, so fine. Then you have seven more. <laughs> Let's say you have an attendant for each tennis court. That's still that's, that's still yeah. fucking 143 <laughs> more roles to fill, my friend. Uh, anyway, but yeah. So I mean, who knows? But um, yeah, who knows? Yeah. Do you have a song that's misunderstood? Like I'm thinking REM's "The One I Love," which is like a bitter, I almost hate it, you kind of a, song. And it's a classic song. And it, yeah, and it's a yeah. classic song, but people play it at their wedding. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, is there a song uh, yeah, that I mean, you have that? You're like, ah, eh, you're kind of missing it, but I, I, you've done I it. mean, yes, there are. Although, I mean, I want to, well, okay. I, the, I, I, no, I understand everyone has. Yeah, that's the, the thing. I do, I do want. think that interpretation is, is prime, is, takes primacy yeah. in art. Do you know what I mean? If, and if other people read it a different way, then cool. That's their interpretation. Um, I mean, I, the song Love Iron Song is pretty misinterpreted in my canon, I think. Yeah. In the sense that, like, people play that at kind of, like, demonstrations and stuff. And I'm kind of like... Really? Okay, this is a song about how everything you're doing is kind of pointless bullshit, but you know, that's okay, there I was you go. Gonna give. We yeah. did. We, while we were making the film, we wrote where we play. We were invited to play uh, the Twelve Bar Club, which had been occupied by squatters. Yeah. It was the last great music venue on on Denmark Street in London that was being gentrified. And so he said, "Do you want to risk getting arrested and come down and film me doing a squat show?" And, and so we did. And we went down. He stood at the corner of a broken pool table, um, and everyone was smoking. And it was a dive, and it was filled with hippies. And somebody yelled out. Play Love Iron Song. And I went, the, the song that talks about idiot fucking hippies. <laughs> yeah, totally. Okay, fine. Well, and just the whole line about 1905 and 1917 is like, 1905 was, was a total pipe dream. And, and, it was, and it's possible to glorify it because it failed yeah. on its own terms. And, um, and 1917 succeeded on its own terms and led to sort of 80 years of mass slavery and 
totalitarian murder and uh and, right. and it's just like you know it's, it, it, there's, there's a, that song is bitter as fuck and it's dripping with sarcasm and a lot of people have taken it to be um sincere sincere well it is sincere i mean the thing is it's a complex piece i guess or at least he said uh but, but you know what i mean like there no, is, it there is. is a, i am complex there is a, there's a degree of optimism to it but i mean sure. generally speaking i think it's a very bitter song so there's that but i mean um but it, but if that's what people take away from it i don't want to stop people into reading that into it that's fine i understand uh, let me say a song, and you just tell a story. It could be something funny that happened in the studio, or like you said, sure. you're humming in the... Uh, one of my favorites is If Ever I Stray. If Ever I Stray. I mean, that's yeah, that's a song. I, I wrote that in a sound check in St. Petersburg, Florida, at Janice Landing. Um, we were opening for Social D, and I just started messing around with a quite traditional country figure. And then had something together very, very quickly, which felt great. Um, and I just kind of knew what the arrangement was going to be right at the beginning as well. And, and it just came together very fast, which was a good feeling. Um, the music video for that sucked. Every single treatment for the music video that we got sent. Is that the one where you throw a chair in slow motion at the river? At the sea. The ocean. Sea. At I Bamba think it's a, Oh, it's a sea. Well, it's the thing sea. is, so every single treatment for a music video that we got sent involved me being in water, which, given the lyrics, is fair enough. But I was at least thinking we could be in the, you know, the Caribbean. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then we had one day off from tour when I could film it when we were in the northeast of the UK at Bamba Castle, where the sea is extremely fucking cold. Um, so uh, I spent a day wading around the sea, which was no fun. And then, to top it all off, about a week later, the director called back and just said he really needs to reshoot some bits because he hadn't quite got, he want, got what he wanted. So he took it down to Hastings, and we began to see in Hastings. Was, so, that was not one of my videos. No, it was not one of his. But yeah, so I had a second day of fucking around in the sea, being freezing yeah. cold. Um, and there are continuity errors in terms of the location in the video, not that anyone's ever noticed that. But um, yeah, that sucked. Yeah. Um, not much fun. Uh, next song, how about Hits and Misses? Hits and Misses. Hits and Misses, I mean, I don't write concept records, but it's possible to massage the material that you have afterwards into a sort of coherent narrative. And the material for Tape Deck Heart, you know, that ended up sort of being a breakup record because most of the material that I had was about the end of a relationship. But I wrote Hits and Misses in that period of time about the person that all the other songs were about when I was trying to sort of like be positive about what was happening between us. And then once the rest of the record was done, it just didn't fit, you know what I mean? So, um... <laughs> I love that song, actually. It's a nice little song. It doesn't get it doesn't get aired that often. It doesn't. It has a kazoo solo on it as well, which... I think that's why I'm in love with it. Right, I, I learned how to now, make... How, how did the kazoo come in? Was you messing around at the studio? I just had or... it in my head. I just knew it that It was song. in your head, you I knew, knew... that song had a kazoo, kazoo. solo in it. Oh, I just knew it did. That's brilliant. Well, the thing was, and we were in the studio and they didn't have a kazoo. I think they might have had one, but just hid it from me because they were skeptical. <laughs> so um, I ran out. You can make a kazoo from a toilet roll and tin oh, foil yeah. and a rubber band. And, um, but if you're trying to buy those things in a corner shop while sweating and looking panicked, they think you're a crackhead. So, um, <laughs> I need all your kazoo. Yeah. <laughs> kind of, kind of, uh, uh, like, uh, um, kind of like tin foil, yeah, and some like rubber bands and. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. Very nice. How about one more song? Uh, one. Four simple words. Four simple words. Um, the beginning of that song, I remember quite distinctly coming to me in the backstage of the docks in Hamburg, when we were playing with again with Social D. Um, we'd been on tour together for a while. We were doing a five night stand at the docks in Hamburg, and I was hanging out with their bass player, and um, I just had this idea of like a, a vaudevillian punk song. I mean, I, I, at the time, I was also very deeply involved in reading about the history of music hall and vaudeville, and that kind of thing, um, sort of 19th century popular music. Um, and yeah, I just thought it'd be kind of interesting to have a vaudevillian punk song, so that whole kind of intro came together, and then it became a punk song, and it went from there. Um, so, so that was your idea in the beginning to go that 90 seconds and then no, I think in the beginning arms. it was just going to be a vaudevillian song. Oh, really? Yeah. Put that together, and it wasn't quite enough to sustain an entire song. Yeah. So I started thinking about where it could go from there. But yeah, we I kind of wrote the song and finished it up on on the road. And I remember the last show of the tour, which was in December, and this would be December twenty twelve, I guess. Is that right? Yeah, somewhere around there. We played in a venue called PPC in Graz in Austria, southern Austria, which is an awesome town where we do really well. And we played the song live for the first time and everybody went fucking apeshit. And it was like, okay, this is, this, <laughs> this works. Yeah, this is a song. 
Uh, if you don't mind sharing any pre-show rituals, something you feel like you need to do or want to do, or... um, it's all pretty, uh, pretty um, solid hour and a half on the computer. Utilitarian. I mean, I generally, I mean, it slightly depends on the type of show it is. Tonight, I'm just talking about a film, so I will be drinking some beers. But um, uh, before a full band show, I generally stretch for about half an hour, 45 minutes, because I injured my back on tour in 2013, which sucked a lot. So I do some stretching, and then I warm my voice a bit. Um, if I'm having a bad day with my voice, I steam my voice out. I've got a horrible cold right now, by the way, you can probably hear. Um, and then um, and then I generally change into my stage clothes, have a shot of Jameson, and then me and the band, we all high five, everybody high fives everybody else. And then we're on. It's, it's, there's nothing particularly sort of mystical. Yeah. Cool. Uh, let's uh, change a little bit. What's the most trouble you've ever been in? <laughs> most, uh, wow. Uh, fucking hell, that's a question. I mean. <laughs> and not one that you should probably answer. <laughs> well, Yeah, I mean, go ahead. Tell, yeah, just tell me to be quiet. No, I mean, it depends what level you're talking about. I mean, I got in trouble at school a bunch. Um, yeah. I've been in trouble in my personal life. I've been in trouble with the law. I've been arrested a bunch when yeah. I was younger. I used to dem be an anarchist, want to be anarchist. Yeah. I used to get arrested quite a lot, but they never charged me with anything. Is there um, something you can't live without? Is there something I can't live without? Um, I mean, music, that's a boring, quite a boring answer, <laughs> but it's true. Music and, um, uh, I, yeah, music, fuck it, there we go. Yeah. I'm still thinking about the trouble one, I think it's a good <laughs> question. I mean, I got in trouble at school a bunch because I used to skip sports to go and like nerd out and play with computers and stuff. Yeah. And I kept getting busted for making up excuses. Yeah. And um, I, I got in trouble for skipping sports for going and hiding in the movies. Yeah. So. And there you go. Um, and then, I mean, I've got, yeah, yeah, I've, I've got very close to getting busted yeah. quite a few times with, in, with things that I shouldn't with have. With bad things, yeah. Yeah. We'll leave it at that. I like yeah, that. There's been uh, some hairy moments. Let's uh, finish up with uh, a hidden talent that maybe someone wouldn't expect you uh, to do. Like, let's say you make a mean omelet. Is there, <laughs> he does is not it, make is there, <laughs> is there, is there uh, anything like that? Oh, look, it's the film. <laughs> Sorry. Um, my my yeah. hidden talent is throwing my voice. Oh, you're good. You are good. No, I don't know. My hidden talent. Um, that's a surprise. Yeah, I can. No, that's not. I got. I have grade two harp. Yeah. Really? Yeah. You're a harpist. I was <laughs> a long time ago. There are photos of me playing the harp. Yeah. So you sit at home doing the Lord of the Rings soundtrack. Um, I was like nine, and the thing was, I got okay at it, and then I moved to schools, and the new school didn't have like a harp that I could play, so we had to buy one, and they cost like forty grand for a Oh, I can only imagine. So my parents were like, "Fuck you, yeah. no way." <laughs> Here's an acoustic guitar. Good luck. Well, then, it. then I started listening to it. I made it. So yeah. That's my mum. Yeah. All right. Thank you very it's my much, pleasure. guys. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I, I'm sure it picked up. Cool. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. This is great. Yeah. Awesome.